Yeah, well, thank you, Suzanne, for uh, the introduction. There's some new faces, there's some old faces, and I just, um, the team's been doing an awesome job, and I have come out of hibernation to meet with everyone, and I'm really happy to be here today because this is where I love to be. I want to be with you guys so that we can help other people in the community just get further educated, get empowered. And the new patient education is one of those tools. So not to pick on anyone, but uh, by a show of hands, can I know who the lupus patients are? Everyone patients? Some, some not. And then uh, providers, uh, any healthcare nurses? Uh, OK, great, great. So you know, one of the opening statements we have with the new patient education classes you will learn the most from support groups and educational seminars than you will with any other resource. When you get together with patients and we, we can gather together, you will learn so much more. And I think I'm very fortunate because I've had the privilege of sitting with many, many lupus patients and learning firsthand through Suzanne what lupus really is. And um, when a patient is first diagnosed, where do they turn to? Where do they go? Today, we go to Dr. Google right away, right? And that can be a very scary place for patients to go look for information. Uh, what we really hope is that when they Google search that the Lupus Foundation is the first resource that pops up. Why? Because the Lupus Foundation is the leading source of information, accurate information, backed up by research and data that's provided to the community. So we're hoping that those Google searches are getting to them. Um, but once, once you get to those pages and sites, NIH, uh, big medical journals, and you're reading through these things, where do people turn to to get clarification? Again, we hope they're turning to us. So the new patient education class is a tool that hopefully you guys can get out into the community and gather groups of people because it's the first place you turn to after diagnosis. So we want to spend some time with getting to know our doctors because we're here to assist them. We want to help patients understand what lupus is, how to live well, how to, how to live better with lupus. Um, so I'm excited to show this to you, and I know Dr. Van Warren and uh, has been doing what is lupus. And so a lot of this stuff we're going to breeze right through. But I want to point out a few things to you guys when presenting this. So this is kind of a train the trainer kind of course. And having patients and healthcare providers here, we should be all on the same page together, OK? Um, and let's see. I didn't practice with this. So and there we go. So why are we all here today? I think we're all here today because we have a sense of calling. Um, there's something within us that wants to get out to the community and help one another, and that's great, and, that, and that's why I hope you're here. But why are patients coming to you, right? And so what we know is that 80% of the U.S. population know little or nothing about lupus. It's a big problem. We have to fix that. So it starts here. We're the boots on the ground. We're getting that information out. We're going to clarify things for them. Um, and the reality is, is the people that are most at risk <coughs> are least aware of the disease. Big problem. We got to get in front of these people and help them, help guide them to the factual information, looking for hope, new journey, um, not being sad and depressed and maybe isolated. Let's get them out and get them educated. Um, so a lot of the times, also, it's not just the patients that are coming to the new patient education. Uh, we really want families to come along. You know, who's that support system? And then did I ask if there's any um, like family that are supporting, like co-facilitators to the patient here? Yeah, you could be both, right? Healthcare and that, that provider for someone that's coming along. So that's great. Um, this, this program is really designed to help receive that knowledge and get us all on the same page. We want to speak with one voice so that it can be better understood. Dr. Singer uh, is awesome. She is one of the most brilliant minds out there. Her presentation was a little over my head, to be quite honest with you, you know. Um, and so it's hard to get all that information out. She said lupus is so heterogeneous that it's different for each patient, and that's true. So if it's different for each patient, how can we be clear about the points we're trying to get across? This is how we're going to get there. We're, we have a PowerPoint to get to our communities, to get to the people, to let them know what we're trying to do. So Dr. Van Warren did speak about what is lupus. And just really quickly, my clicker is not really working, um, what I talk about with what is lupus. And we all know that lupus is an overactive immune system. And I kind of just think of a boxing match, right? Your immune system is boxing out foreign invaders, trying to weed out the viruses, the infection. But with lupus, it's boxing out everything. 
so that boxing match that that immune system of lupus patient's going through, and I just take it down to that layman's terms and try to make it simple for them. It's boxing out everything. It's fighting everything in their body. And what we need to do is help calm that down. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Uh, Van Warren went much more into detail with it. So we're going to kind of skim over this, right? Um, and hopefully he talked about being lupus is a disease, uh, a disease that has flares and remission. What is the goal for each lupus patient? It is to find remission, right? That is the goal. And so that's that sense of hope when, when they come to us, I want them, them to know that. You're here today because we're trying to find out how to get on your path to remission, how to be the best person to manage your disease. So who gets lupus? It's approximately 1.5 million Americans have a form of lupus, 5 million throughout the world, and we believe about 60,000 Ohioans have a form of lupus. That means we got a big job. We got a big job to do. We got to hit a lot of cities. Uh, I heard 14 symposiums we're doing. 14 this year? Over the whole state? Over the whole ah, well, it's a lot of cities to get to, a lot of people to get involved. So we'll keep going because I know Dr. Van Warren went through a lot of these things. What are the causes? We talk a lot about genetic predisposition and environmental triggers, right? This shouldn't be any new news to anyone. And truthfully, what we believe, it's, it's both. It's, it's something coming and engaging, something inactive in the immune system, and coming, having these signs and symptoms come out in our body. So how are we going to get the information? Um, truthfully, I was kind of fishing with uh, Dr. Singer's presentation about talking about research studies. How do we get involved, right? And um, something we should be proud about is that a research study that happened hmm, probably in the late 90s, early 2000s was Lumina, Nature versus Host. Without the information, they gathered 300 minority people, women, most, mostly women, to figure out why is lupus more severe in the minority population. If those 300 people didn't come out, would we be further uh, ahead or behind the game? Right? And so what they did find is that minority population have the disease more severe overall. This is fact. This is what they're finding. They develop it earlier in life. They experience greater disease activity at the time of diagnosis, including kidney involvement. And they have more neurological problems such as seizures, hemorrhages, and strokes. So I did a little bit of research and I wanted to know how many active lupus research studies are happening. Um, and what I found on clinicaltrials.gov is there is 386 active studies happening. That is huge for us. And something the Lupus Foundation is doing is we are making sure that the monies are being funneled towards proper research initiatives, like the mesenchymal, the stem cell infusions. We really want to see good information and hopefully a cure comes from these things. Um, and about 88, actual factual, 88 of those clinical trials are in Ohio. So that's pretty huge for us. Um, so if you're ever looking in your groups, and um, I know Kim was talking about how do you know if you want to get involved. So you can search on clinicaltrials.gov to see what's open to you. And that is a conversation you should bring up to your rheumatologist and talk to them about or if you have people come to the group. Is this something for me? And it's not that you're getting rid of your, your old team. You're introducing more. So you're going to keep up with those follow-up appointments with your regular rheumatologist. But now you're doing something more so that the people you know, that are diagnosed after us might not have to go through the things that those patients are going through. Um, so just a little bit of back research on that. Um, Yep, so Lumina, without that information, without the research, we wouldn't have this information. So it's so important for people to get involved. And I know GSK was talking about um, a picture that she has in the binders here. We have this picture, too. And when you're going through the presentation, I, I spend a little bit of time here. Because when you have caregivers or people that's not understanding lupus, what I say is, you know, you can't, I can't tell in this room who has lupus and who doesn't. You know, if you didn't raise your hand, I wouldn't know. And sometimes family members don't necessarily understand that. And I always say, does it take me la taking away layers of the skin for you to see what's going on on the inside of the body? And our GSK representatives kept saying head to toe. 
Lupus can affect the body, any organ, any system in the body. I've had a lupus patient that says, my hair hurts. Physically, the hair on her head was hurting her. And, you know, we can't see that, but, you know, if we can take a bit of time on this screen and just go through how lupus can affect any organ, any system in the body. And they kind of go through these check marks. Like, yeah, that happened to me, that happened to me, that happened to me. So when you're doing the presentation, just take a little bit of time to discuss each um, organ system. So the economic impact of lupus, it's a no-brainer. It's expensive to be chronically ill, right? And what we're seeing is an average cost of twelve to $62,000 a year, depending on the severity of the disease. Um, unfortunately, many patients do rely on government services to afford their medications and health care. Um, the annual lupus patient is going to see the doctors three times more likely in the office and 13 times more likely in an outpatient facility. So they're routinely following up with their doctors. Those bills add up. If a patient is in need of kidney dialysis, it requires um, uh, $60,000 per year on average. And we know sometimes the side effects of medication can lead to hip replacement. Um, or joint diseases, and when that happens, uh, you're looking at about twelve to one hundred and five thousand dollars a year. So, it's it's a no-brainer. It's expensive to be chronically ill. Now, the four different types of lupus we're going to talk about, and again, we're going to breeze through this because we have a lot of stuff to cover. And I know Dr. Van Warren uh, went through a lot of things, but in this class, we talk about the four different types. We have systemic lupus erythematosus, cutaneous lupus erythematosus or discoid lupus, drug-induced lupus, and prenatal lupus. So with systemic lupus, something I always want to point out is, is that it takes extensive medical history. You're not just going to walk into the doctor's office and then say right away off the bat, this is what's happening. It's difficult to diagnose lupus. Um, I speak a lot about Suzanne because she's what I've known. She's been around and mentoring me my whole life. It took her an average of 15 years to be properly diagnosed. That's a long time to wait to figure out what the heck is happening with you. And uh, one of the good things that's happening now is we're hearing quicker diagnosis. People are seeing a little bit turnaround. But right now it's, it's six years on average that patients are waiting for a proper diagnosis. How many doctor's appointments are you going to in six years or scratching your head or thinking you're a hypochondriac before you can actually get to the people that are able to help you? Um, so it's extensive medical history. Unfortunately, getting to the doctors and reporting those signs and symptoms, that medical journal is great, fabulous, fabulous tool that we're jotting down things that are happening because you get to the appointment. And me and Suzanne do have some funny stories that I'm not going to share, but you forget you forget what happened to you in that six-month time period. Maybe that day you went to the doctors and you feel great. You're so excited to see that doctor that they ask how you're doing and I'm perfect, I'm fine. And then you leave there and it was like a catch-up with your physician instead of, oh wait, I forgot about the joint pain that was happening. I forgot about these things. I can't keep up with my medications. The side effects of my one med might be, or is it something else? You forget about those things. So journaling is something that's very important. We do have a lupus app. Um, truthfully, so we are working on updating it right now. I haven't yet got to meet Amber and um, Dane in the office, and I think that's a project that we'll be spearheading very soon. But there are a few good things that do are, you do have capabilities. The notepad, where you can list your physicians. Um, numbers, the notepad, you can also put your medications on. Uh, we have old school tools. I'm still paper and pen. I love writing things down. You want me to remember it? It's in my notebook and written down and I will be able to pull it up. Um, we do still have those magnetic pads that you just slip the piece of paper there and if an emergency does happen, someone knows how to take that up right off the fridge and you're out the door to the hospital or doctor's appointment. Um, being a nurse, there's many times where I have like big grocery bags that I'm supposed to weed through and figure out this whole table's just filled with medications and are they still taking this? Are they not taking this? Well, this is expired, so they can't be still on that. Um, but so it's so important because uh, it's very important to know what patients are on. Um, speaking of examinations and um, lab tests, 
One thing I wanted to point out here is that, you know, I'm sure we're all online. Um, there's a lot of diagnostic tools out there. There is no one test that will say, yes, you have lupus, no, you do not. And it can be very misleading out there because uh, in advertising, there, there's Avis. Avis is a, is a test that's out there that is kind of misleading to some patients. It needs a bit of interpretation. In doing digging and talking with Dr. Stanley Blue, who's the head of our medical advisory board, um, we talked about this a great deal, and actually the company. So Avis is a diagnostic tool that's developed by Exogen. Um, it is a very expensive uh, designer tool to still help in the diagnosis of lupus. It is not saying if you take this test, you're testing positive for it. Um, it's a neat tool. We actually met with a representative that can show you the ranges of where your biomarkers, where all your proteins are at, how high uh, the inflammation is in your body, and it kind of measures everything. It's a very neat tool, but it's not something access that every, everyday people have access to. It's a very expensive tool. So if they're saying that there's a test out there that says, yes, you do, no, you don't, it, it's, that's not true. It's still a tool that helps in the diagnosis. It's a tracking system. Um, and so I just wanted to be very clear on that. You know, they're looking, the, the AVIS test is looking at biomarkers just like the ANA, the DSDNA, and it's able to measure them. Um, so the one thing that it can do is kind of show you the severity of your disease, the disease activity. That is what it is for sure doing. Um, but still today, what we're using is actually the uh, ACR classification criteria system. And we'll, we'll talk more about that here. And so the ACR classification criteria system is looking at, at the symptoms of lupus, right? And so what we know is that 55% of lupus patients suffer from arthritis or arthralgia. No, uh, one of the things I want to point out, just the history of lupus, is that um, you know, lupus was really categorized under arthritis for many, many, many years. And it wasn't until the Lupus Foundation came along and got us outside of that umbrella of arthritis. So there is some misclaimer because so many people have arthritis that we kind of got lumped under the arthritic diseases. And yes, people with lupus have arthritis, but it is its own separate autoimmune disease. Um, so it took some time there. And we actually kind of felt the repercussions of that. Uh, the advances of medication was a little bit more slow going for lupus patients than for arthritic patients. Um, so that's something that we should be very proud of with the LFA catapulting research for lupus patients to get medications. And now we have Benlista, and there's some other promising meds that are coming down the pipeline. And so the ACR classification criteria system, how this is used is it is just a tool. It's a tool, again, that physicians use. And it's a little bit of an older tool. It was developed in 1982. But it's still a good tool. Dr. Ballou still uses this. And what happens is you have to have four or more of these criteria for that physician to really dig in to see, if, if, is this lupus or is it something else? So the one thing I'm also very proud about with the Lupus Foundation is that there have been revisions to the classification criteria system. Um, because there are new diagnostic tools. There is more elaborate lab work that physicians should be looking at. So with the help of uh, SLIC, it's the Sy Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics, and the LFA helped push these scientists to come together to figure out a new 17-class criteria to help recognize lupus quick, more quickly. And so what does that mean? So overall, this the classification criteria, it, it comes to look at uh, more clinical, relevant clinical information, reflect new knowledge of lupus immunology. 1982 is pretty old. It's older than me. So there is new data out there. Um, it includes updated, more inclusive definitions and variables of lupus, and it helps overcome the concerns with current criteria, just being that it's a, a bit dated. Still a good tool. But there's more things to look at. So what are we really looking at? So again, all the 11 class criteria from the ACR is still here. But now we're able to look at more lab works. So the ANA um, up here is one of those things that patients are like, my, my ANA is positive. I have lupus, but they haven't received a diagnosis. And I think Suzanne touched base upon this a little bit too. 
is that some patients uh, may be symptomatic, but that ANA is not positive. And so that physician will keep them on a bordering fence and, and diagnose that patient with mixed connective tish, tissue disease. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have a bad doctor or a good doctor. It means you have a cautious doctor not wanting to diagnose you right off the bat because you're symptomatic. Uh, the ANA is a helping guide to say if it's lupus or not and how far. There's many people that are bordering. But it's also looking at the anti-DSDNA, antiphospholipids, um, your white blood cell count, your white blood cell count. So there's much more lab work that is um, happening. So our lupus patients, I know when you're going to get your lab works, it's like they bring out a whole tray of all those tubes. And so story of Suzanne, I went with her to the doctors one day to get her lab works drawn. And she went back there and I thought nothing of it. And she, she came out and she said, Leslie, come here. And I was like, uh-oh, what nurse am I going to throw down with back there? What's going on? So I get back there and she goes, look at this. And I'm like, what? And she's like, look at these tubes on here. We counted them. There were like 23 tubes. You know, it's not that much blood, but when, when you get in there and you're just looking at how much they're taking from you, you're just like, people need to know what patients are going through. You know, I go through this every six months, every year, and it's just, it's just mind-blowing to me. But truthfully, so it, it is that lab work that they're really looking at to see how far along your disease progression is. It's not fun, but it is necessary. So treatment overviews, and this is very general. So this is, um, treatments vary on disease, activity, what's involved, and not all patients will be on these medications. Um, but very commonly, uh, patients are on prednisone. So prednisone is um, an anti-inflammatory medication, and with that, it does have a lot of side effects. Um, you know, we never want to abruptly stop prednisone. It should be started at a large loading dose, and sometimes we can kind of tell when patients are on a big, heavy dose of prednisone, right? They kind of have the puffy cheeks. Um, so we want to be mindful of just educating lupus patients what are common side effects. Hair growth with prednisone is pretty common. Unfortunately, facial hair comes with that hair growth. But there's things that we can deal with that. Um, so the moon face I mentioned and a buffalo hump are common uh, side effects of the medication. Um, the biggest thing that I want you guys to be sure to tell patients is once they've started, if they can't keep up with the regimen, to be sure to tell their physician why that they can't keep up with it, because it should never abruptly be stopped, um, or it shouldn't be kept. You know, it, a large loading dose and you taper down off this medicine. If they're like, oh, I feel really good on prednisone, so I'm going to stash a couple pills over when I feel bad, I'm going to take it. That's the last thing patients want to do. They're actually going, could perhaps send themselves into a bigger flare. Um, but we want to be mindful of weaning off the medication. There are some patients, unfortunately, that are on prednisone for life, like 0 0.2 milligrams. Um, we just need better medications. And so it's about talking with the physician to figure out what's the best plan, if they maybe can wean off or maybe they can't. Plaquenil or hydrochloroquine, it's also an, an oldie but goodie. Um, it helps treat skin, um, skin inflammation and skin flares. A few things to be mindful of with Plaquenil is that you need to be consistent with the Plaquenil medication. It needs to be taken at the same time every day. It takes six months for the medication to build up in the system. And the reason why you want to take it the same time every day is because you don't want to fluctuate within your body. You want the steady stream of Plaquenil to build up into the system. Um, and then my big disclaimer is with Plaquenil, if you smoke or anyone else around you smokes, that even secondhand smoke affects the medication. Carcinogens in cigarettes actually decrease the half-life of the medication. So you're spending money to get well, to be on a medication, yet you smoke, which that has a whole nother health issues, but you're actually affecting the medication. So your body isn't able to get the therapeutic effects of the med. So we want to be sure to, uh, to educate our community on that. Even the effects of secondhand smoke, it lingers on your clothes, it's in fabrics of things. Um, so even secondhand smoke, even if they're coming in and you can smell that. Um, NSAIDs, NSAIDs is truthfully the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication that patients should be using to help treat pain. Lupus patients suffer from chronic pain. And unfortunately, we have not figured out a way to get rid of that pain completely. There are pain management. Um, some patients 
uh, are prescribed narcotics, but I will tell you the FDA is coming down on physicians and the prescription process. And um, with the overdose epidemic happening, it's stemming from narcotics being abused and, and overused. So it's not to say that narcotics are a horrible thing. If you are in chronic pain and you need something to help you as you go along, that's fine. You know, a pill here or there. But if you're taking it every day, every day, every day, something has to change. Pain, pain management needs to be brought into the healthcare team so that you can help figure out how to manage. Um, and so you'll really be, you probably are feeling some of the effects if you're suffering from chronic pain uh, from the physicians as far as t taking down your refill prescriptions, right? They're trying to figure out better ways to manage it because there are other side effects with uh, narcotics. Uh, but NSAIDs, truthfully, ibuprofen, Aleve, those are the types of medications to help treat the chronic pain. But we want to be mindful of our stomach, so never take it on an empty stomach. Um, so make sure we're telling our patients that you should, should take it with a little bit of food. Um, aspirin, was it a saying, an aspirin a day takes a, keeps the doctor away? No, that was an apple a day, <laughs> keeps the doctor away. So aspirin, 81 milligrams, a lot of patients are prescribed that, um, but it doesn't mean that they should go out and start that medication. Right? It should be talked about with, with your physician, and it really is just to help with clotting factors and to thin out the blood a little bit. Um, but don't start it um, if you're not prescribed it. What's something that they do need to know, though, about the NSAIDs is if they have kidney disease, yeah. they cannot take it. So kidneys in your stomach. Thank you, Diana. Yes. Um, some, and your, because so many of them have lupus mitosis. Right, right. That is true. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, truthfully, so, yeah, Tylenol um, can affect your, your kidneys a bit. So it's something you want to be mindful of and talk to your physician if there's kidney involvement. Not to say that it affects it, but if you already have kidney involvement, there's other ways to figure out how to manage pain. So pain management is a big, uh, a big uh, partner to get into your health care system. Um, Benlista. So uh, GSK was out here. Benlista is that new kid on the block. Uh, was, actually, let's go to the next slide. Um, it's a biologic medication. Um, it's a synthetic antibody that's infused into the body. And uh, Dr. Singer ha actually had a really great representation of it, because I always do this. Uh, truthfully, lupus is an overabundant amount of B cells in the body, right? And Benlista is a synthetic antibody that binds to those B cells to calm them down. So I don't know if anyone was seeing like those blobs that were connecting to the Y, you know, and that's what it's doing. It's finding those B cells and telling it to stop attacking its own body. Um, so this is a funny story. I'm actually watching cartoons now because that's what babies do and this is new to my life. And uh, we were watching um, song robots, something like that, and they were talking about the immune system. It was a great representation. I was thinking to myself, should I bring this in to show everyone how our immune system? And it was the best little cartoon. And to know that our children are watching these cartoons growing up and they know how volcanoes erupt and how your immune system works. I'm going to bring that video in. Um, but just to know that our immune system is throwing out antibodies, proteins, all the time. And for lupus patients, they're throwing out an overabundant amount of B cells. And what Benlista is, is binding, binding to the B cells to calm them down. Um, truthfully, it's a newer medication. It was developed in 2011. Um, it is not a fit for everyone. Uh, you cannot have kidney involvement and central nervous involvement, although research with Benlista, uh, they're coming out with new data all the time. When patients come to a roadblock and are needing a little bit of help, with the help of their physicians, some patients with central nervous involvement have been on the medication. Some patients with kidney involvement have been on the medication. But this is a trial by error and something that needs to be talked about with your physician. Um, so um, if that is, there's a lot of Benlista buddies too. There's support groups out there I know. Um, our good friend Aletha is a big supporter of uh, Benlista buddies. You know, getting into those groups and talking with other people about how they're doing on the medication is a great way to get involved with one another. All right, so cutaneous lupus, truthfully, uh, cutaneous lupus or discoid lupus, it only affects the skin. Uh, symptoms include rashes, lesions, hair loss, vasculitis, ulcers. Um, but some individuals with cutaneous lupus will develop systemic lupus, uh, about 10% of them. 
So some of the pictures that we see that we share with our group is that malar rash. That's the pretty common butterfly rash, right? It's the rash that goes across the cheeks to the bridge of the nose. About one third of systemic of SLD patients actually have the butterfly, butterfly rash or the malar rash. Uh, discoid lupus accounts for approximately 10% of the lupus of uh, lupus conditions. And so what you're actually seeing here with the discoid rashes, they're coin-like lesions. They're round circular lesions that can develop anywhere on the body, right? So discoid can sometimes be scarring to the skin. Um, I don't know if you guys know the singer seal, Heidi Klum's ex-husband, how he has those deep scars in his face. Um, those are actually effects of discoid lupus, um, but I believe his lupus is in remission, so that's great. Um, and the subcutaneous rash, uh, that makes up for about 10% of the overall lupus uh, diagnosis. So again, uh, red raised lesions that can develop anywhere on the body. Um, but about 50% of these individuals meet the criteria for systemic lupus. So when you have the subcutaneous la uh, rash, about 50 and are just diagnosed with cutaneous lupus first, about 50% of them will develop into systemic. And so diagnosis, it's really the same way we diagnose um, SLD lupus. The only difference is, is that we can biopsy those lesions. So a dermatologist or rheumatologist can take a biopsy of those lesions and see if there is any autoimmune issues going on. So what are the treatment options? Uh, sunblock, sunblock, sunblock. I don't know if that's come up a lot here, but it's been something that we've really been hitting on uh, the past few um, years back doing all these educational symposiums, SPF really is a lupus patient's best friend, even uh, someone with a normal immune system. What's actually happening with the UV light is it's actually affecting the B cells in the body. So although you might not burn or have a rash, that long exposure is actually aggravating those B cells. So it's a chemical reaction that's happening. Um, our GSK representative, I'm so sorry, what's her name again? Angie, that's the first time I met her. She was talking about sleeves that patients are putting on their arms because you're not realizing that driving arm on that 20 minute, 45 minute car drive back and forth to your home or work is affecting you. And you might feel a little bit more drained. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be a recluse from the sun. It means you need to protect yourself. So wearing your SPF, wearing long sleeves, um, and still enjoying normal things but limiting that sun exposure is what we need to do. So one simple thing we really need to be educating the communi uh, and communicating to our public is um, sunblock, sunblock, sunblock. I want to point out uh, one thing with cultural insensitivity issues. So I was giving this talk to a group of minority women, and the group laughed at me. Oh, I don't need to wear sunblock, honey. I have pigment. I don't burn. I don't, I don't need to do that. And what we need to tell them is that it's actually affecting you on a cellular level. So no matter what variation color, skin color you are, if you have lupus, the sun is affecting you. And also, the sun also denatures your skin. It ages you quicker. So just take that general stance of letting them know it doesn't matter what skin tone you have. If you burn easy, tan well, it's affecting you on a molecular level. So topical ther therapies for treating discoid lupus, there's corticoid steroids, there's liquid injections, uh, there's steroid topical creams like Eladel and Protopic that treat those rashes. And when lupus becomes um, the oral medications, the first line of choice is the anti-malarial, that's the Plaquenil. And then the second choice is the Dapazodes, uh, retinoids. And then the, the heavy hitters are the third choice. These are the chemo medications, right? Those heavy hitters. And what we need to educate our community about is that it's low doses of chemo medications, unfortunately, lupus patients are on. So I think the big thing with Selena Gomez coming out, right, everyone was in the grocery store line seeing Selena Gomez take, has lupus, taking chemo medications. What does the community automatically assume lupus is? Yeah. Right. And so we have to let them know lupus is not cancer. Cancer is bad malignant cells. Lupus patients have good cells, but they have overactive good cells that are just fighting everything. And so unfortunately, um, the downside to taking the medication, uh, chemo medications, is that it affects the good and the, the bad cells. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. So they still have to take precautions um, like a chemo patient would, but it's very low doses of the medication.
So drug-induced lupus. Going to seminars, um, physicians, I've heard them say that drug-induced lupus isn't like a true form of lupus. Or is it? I always say that to myself. Or is it? Um, is it something dormant in the immune system that is triggered by a medication? And the reason why they're saying it's not a true form of lupus, it's because once the medication is discontinued, the signs and symptoms within six months tends to go away. But I have met a patient in a support group that still has an aura of a lupus flare within her body. So uh, she's asymptomatic, but she still kind of feels the achiness and things going on. So is something still kind of um, active in her immune system, or has it completely gone dormant once the medication is gone? So the 46 culprit medications, um, oops, the three top culprit meds are listed here. They're heart medications, hydralazine, quinidine, and procandamine. Um, I have a list of the 46 medications and um, a medical journal that I found that I wanted to share with you. The one thing is, is that I ask that you not share it with your whole group. Don't disperse this information. This should be just for your eyes only to know what medications are the culprit med, being that you don't want to induce panic. So if there's a medication on there that you know of, you want to have them talk to their physicians about it because the physician and the patient is a leading source of information on how to treat their lupus. So actually, if it's okay with Adrian, Suzanne, and Jackie, if we want to email the, the actual medical journal that I found, um, I have it um, to share with everyone. Um, but I just ask that you keep it within your group. This is for you to read um, and to keep, keep your eyes only. Um, symptoms, symptoms uh, once the medication has discontinued, they will stop within six months. And so they, they are experiencing the same side effects uh, same experiences of lupus with the joint pain, muscle pain, flu-like symptoms, inflammation um, that's happening in the body. So how are we diagnosing? It's the same way that we treat, uh, diagnose SLE and discoid. Um, and really the chronic pain that they're experiencing, we're still treating with immunosuppressants and NSAIDs. And we talked about it going away within six months. So neonatal lupus, again, um, you can't, it's, lupus is not contagious, right? Um, but when a baby is born, they take on the mom's immune system for at least the first six months of life. Um, they're, they're taking antibodies from breast milk and from mom. Um, so they might have some of these side effects. And it happens in about two, two to three percent cases of moms that develop, uh, that have lupus and are pregnant. And one thing I want to point out is that, um, Lupus patients can get pregnant, right? But they are considered high-risk patients. So we want to be mindful of educating a patient. A patient wants to be in remission for at least a year to uh, conceiving, and family planning is what's necessary. Now, there are some patients that are unfortunately receiving the side effects of chemo medication, and so we might want to start talking to them about preserving their eggs if they want to conceive. Um, prior to starting the chemo meds. So that might be an option for them if they want to say, can we plan? Yeah. No. Benlist is a biologic medication. Um, chemo meds were the third uh, line of choice that I was talking about, like Celsep, methotrexate, things of those medications. Yeah, so if family planning is something that you want to do, you might want to think about reserving your eggs, right? Um, patients, lupus patients are considered high risk, though, when they're pregnant. Um, a lot of patients develop preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure or protein in the urine. So we want to be mindful of those things. Bed rest is sometimes necessary. I actually just saw on a uh, social media platform that one of our followers just had her first baby. Uh, she did have to deliver a, a bit early, but it was a successful pregnancy. <laughs> and so I'm very happy for her because I know that was a, a big part of her family planning. Um, so it is possible to have babies, and I know a lot of you probably have kids too. Um, also, I want to point out um, in utero, um, about 2 to 3% of cases, some babies are born with a, a congenital heart anomaly. And this is caught pretty early on because uh, the physician will notice that the baby's heart rate is a bit low. And so it seems to be a complication with lupus that happens in some cases. And so patients will be on a bit of bed rest and, and monitored uh, very closely. Okay. So what kinds of doctors are lupus patients seeing? You guys know. It is the whole 
system that's involved. So they might be seeing a cardiologist along with their rheumatologist, along with their primary care. Maybe they're seeing a nephrologist, a urologist. Well, that can get pretty overwhelming at times. So helping patients identify who's their quarterback of physicians, so to speak. Who is the leader in the team that they can talk to and communicate with? Truthfully so, for a lupus patient, it's easier for them to get in with their primary care physician than their rheumatologist. But some patients have great relationships with their rheumatologist and can get that email and communication pretty quickly. Um, but more times than not, it's probably the primary care physician that is that go-to person to seek help for. It's really important to help a patient identify who that physician is. Maybe it's a nurse practitioner, but that quarterback is the one who is calling all the plays, pulling the strings and talking with the nephrologist, making sure cardiology is involved to make sure the team is all together. Um, so we, we definitely want to help point out that it is a team of doctors that you have, and it can be quite exhausting following up with all the physicians, especially if some patients are traveling an hour to 40 minutes to get to see those specialists. So it is a part of the process, and we want to help them understand that it does take the whole team to help properly treat uh, a lupus patient and diagnose them. So lupus and pregnancy, we talked about it being um, high risk, uh, about family planning, the risk factors increase uh, uh, for poor fetal outcome. We were talking about the congenital heart anomalies, the preeclampsia. Um, but I want to reassure patients that if this is what, what you want to do, you know, seeking help with your rheumatologist and peritologist, uh, a high-risk OB specialist is who a patient needs to see to family plan. No? Oh, there you go. Thanks, Jackie. So we talked about uh, lupus flares and remission. We did not talk about the definition. So a definition of a flare is a sudden increase in disease activity. Um, this definition of a lupus flare might seem common to us, but it was not always recognized medically by the health community. So a lot of patients were having needing to get on dis onto disability, but there was no clear definition as to what a lupus flare is. Well, we know now that uh, it has been defined medically that it's a sudden increase in disease activity. Uh, remission, we know we're in remission when we're 100% symptom-free. There is no pain. Uh, all lab works are back into normal, back into homeostasis or where they should be. And so um, the goal for each lupus patient is remission. And we also want to teach patients when to learn to call the physician. So when to learn to call the physician? When there's change in your disease activity. Is something new popped up? Is there a new sign and symptom? Are you recording this in your medical journal and noticing something new is coming about? Um, that's when to call the doctor. So this is always my favorite part of the presentation to get to. It's the lifestyle changes for living better with lupus. We want to empower, we want to educate patients on how to live well with lupus. What do they need to do to manage a chronic illness? Um, so we go through you know, pretty simple things to think about, but maybe just driving them home to reiterate the things that we need to be doing. So exercise with alternate, alternate periods of rest. I'm not talking about going on a marathon and starting Orange Theory and hitting those anaerobic zones or whatever they're all about in, in Orange Theory. You know, light stretching is, is, is being physical, getting up and moving. Um, in the office, I used to make everyone stretch at 3.30 and do yoga poses. And Suzanne would be like, what are you guys doing? We need to move. You need to get the blood circulating. You, you need to get things going. Um, so I'm not just talking about, you know, hitting gyms hard, talking with your physician about what is a good regimen for you. I'm a big advocate for yoga. Ultraviolet light, fluorescent lighting, we need to take precautions um, and minimize sun exposure. So we're, we're moving more towards LED bulbs, but for a while those big fluorescent light bulbs in our lamps were a big thing. Um, they're phasing out, but they do, um, sometimes they, they omit UV rays that affect lupus patients. Um, so what can you do to minimize exposure? A lot of the times um, fluorescent light bulbs have covers on them. In the office we have a film that covers that has UV protection in it. A lot of lampshades have that protection as well. I've seen them in Home Depot that they have um, protection. So we want to be mindful of that. I can remember a time that uh, actually a young kid came to new patient education class and she was wearing a ball cap. 
and it affected her so bad that she needed the brim of the hat to protect her cheeks from the fluorescent light bulbs. Um, and she actually had to have um, a physician's note that she was allowed to wear a ball cap in school. So, uh, you know, we, we need to educate them that even fluorescent lights can have an effect. Um, diet and supplements, this is a hot topic for a lot of patients. They want to know, what should I be eating? What should I be doing? Truthfully, so there is no one lupus diet. But we've done a lot of seminars, a lot of talks about what diets patients should be on. And the general consensus is a good overall healthy diet. The Mediterranean diet is a diet high in fruits and vegetables, um, high in lean protein. So fish, poultry, um, soy products, there's you know, non-animal plant-based proteins that could be um, consumed. Um, but generally, it's a good healthy diet. You hear a lot of fad things like going gluten will help decrease inflammation and things of that nature. And that, you know, we need to do more medical research towards diet. And yes, that can help, but can everyone? Does it help for everyone? That's the general consensus that we don't have out there. So keeping a good variety of fruits and vegetables in your diet, thinking about how to decrease inflammation. A couple things that we do know is that red meat, fried food, do cause inflammation. And so it doesn't mean you can't ever have a french fry and burger. It just means if you're having french fries and burgers and fried foods, you know, five times throughout the week, maybe thinking about limiting it and start lessening it just being more mindful of those things. Smoking, we talked about how it affects the medication. In general, it's just a bad habit, and we should talk about smoking cessation and how to uh, stop the bad habit. Sleep and rest. Uh, many patients suffer from chronic fatigue. That's a big complaint, right? And one of the things that we want to be mindful of is if a patient is going about their day and rushing to get home to jump into bed, because they just can't wait to get there. They're not even taking their clothes off. They're just head diving right into that bed and hitting the alarm clock to wake up the next day. Something is wrong. Something has to change. And I appreciate the head nodding because, you know, it, it is what's happening. And, and you're not realizing it. You might be going a couple weeks with hitting this, and you're on the way to hitting rock bottom because your body just can't keep up with that energy level. And having a lupus diagnosis doesn't mean that, you know, it's the end. It means you're... You need to figure out the new beginning. What are the ways that you're going to manage it? And hopefully coming to this class will help open your eyes to seeing that preparing your body for sleep and rest, um, limiting um, screen time on your phone. Uh, actually, the blue filter lights on your eyes are actually making you a bit more fatigued. So thinking about that. Um, monitor time, screen time with your computer. Thinking of ways to conserve your energy. I'm a big um, advocate for just unplugging. So if you're working and you need to just take a 15 minute break, uh, just getting into a quiet space, set the alarm clock on your phone or tell a friend that you're, you're gonna take a break for a little bit and if they could call you back, to just make sure you didn't fall asleep so you don't get fired. Um, and just letting them know and just literally scanning your body, unplugging from the world and all the distractions, any pain that's having, having in your body and push it out. And I like to envision white light just kind of scanning over my body and washing away any negative energy and just taking that bit of time. And I know that sounds kind of hokey, but if you just take that time for yourself to just recharge, re-energize, you'll see a change definitely in the day. Um, so proper rest is definitely important. Physician's orders, always following the recommendations of your physician. Um, if there's a recommendation that you can't follow, being open and honest and telling them, look, I can't do this. We've prescribed a medication that you're take, I'm supposed to take two times a day, but I just can't get that second dose in. It, it just never happens. I always miss it. It's about talking about ways to figure out when you can take it or, or how to best take it. So following the recommendations of physicians, I'm going to be honest, rheumatologists have told us that lupus patients are not very compliant with medications, that it's hard for people to keep on the regimen, and I can't, we can't blame them. How many pills of medication are you supposed to take? How are you supposed to take it? What are you supposed to take it with, not take it with? It can be very time consuming. Um, but it is about talking to that physician and making sure what you're doing is best. And that goes along with taking your medications as prescribed, right? Point it at the machine. Thank you, that's very helpful, Jackie. Uh, so more coping measures, controlling fatigue, learning to pace activity, you know, removing yourself from a stressful situation and trying to relax, 
controlling stress and using methods to control it. Um, you know, I, I tend to think about stress and anger as like, uh, you know, you think of a pop bottle. You shake it up, you get agitated, it gets kind of fizzy, right? And you build up that pressure. That pressure keeps coming about because you're not able to take the time for yourself. Well, one day that top's going to blow, right? And nobody wants to see that because you don't feel good and everyone else is going to get it. Um, so we want to be able to be sure that we're just identifying what is stressful, what is aggravating us, and look to people who can help us. Um, sometimes it's a significant other. Sometimes it's a family member. Sometimes it's the Lucas Foundation. So many times I have patients throughout the state calling in just to vent to see what's going on. And truthfully, our office does care. Our office is staffed with lupus patients, healthcare providers, and I think because our organization is led by a patient, it makes us more passionate and understanding to helping that patient. So just know that in your group, you have the support system of the LFA um, in your back pocket. Uh, managing depression, unfortunately, a lot of lupus patients do become depressed. If you can imagine that time period in six years of not knowing what's happening, not knowing what's going on, can lead to a very stressful and dark time. Um, a lot of lupus patients talk about a dark time that they have with trying to figure out what's going on with them. And we don't want to see that. We want to help people know that you can live well. Uh, so how do you do those things? How do you manage the anger, the stress, um, depression that's going on? One thing with depression, you know, talk to your doctor. Uh, it could be, unfortunately, another medication, but a useful medication. Um, it's truth truthfully a chemical imbalance that can be helped, right? But joining a support group, networking with other people that are like you. And I originally started opening up and saying that you will learn more from other lupus patients than you will from anyone else. And so it's important to get into a community that understands you. And that's what we're creating, is a community that understands and has empathy for one another because they've seen it or they're going through it. Um, so definitely being an active support group member and becoming more active with your local chapter. So I want to thank everyone that's here because getting involved is you're the first link to someone else that might be looking for help. Uh, resolving guilt and modifying thoughts and behavior. Our mind is very powerful. It can control a lot of things in our body, and we need to be mindful of uh, what's happening. If you're feeling guilty because you can't clean the whole house top to bottom, on the Saturday like you always used to. You could clean every bathroom, every uh, kitchen counter, and be done with it and be fine. But now you can barely just put the laundry away or put the dishes away in the sink. It's OK. It's OK to let the dishes sit in the sink for a night or two. It's OK to ask someone to come over for help, to say, will you help me put my clothes away and hang out for a little bit? It's just knowing who you can turn to and who you can identify to help you with those things. So result. Resolve those guilty thoughts. Uh, workplace issues, discuss it with your employer. Uh, lupus patients are covered through the American Disability Act uh, within reasonable accommodations. You are allowed uh, a reasonable accommodation. So maybe that is you need an additional 15 minutes a day to take your medications and unplug and take that mindful meditation that your body needs, right? It's not saying taking advantage of it and saying, my doctor says I need a two-hour lunch break every day. It's, it's a reasonable accommodation. So talking with your HR department about what you can do to help manage what you have to get done in that time frame. Um, addressing sexuality issues and, and not hiding from the problem. Sexuality is a normal process of our life. It's a normal process of being. So if you're having issues with that, talking about your doctor talking with your doctor and your significant other on how you can address those issues is very important. The most important thing is developing a good doctor-patient-physician relationship because that line of communication is what's needed to help manage your disease. And so when you get in with a good doctor who's open and honest and responsive, you're in good hands. So how do you know you have a good doctor? Right? I know uh, Yvonne was joking about the doctor that's always typing away and uh, maybe more consumed in the computer and not physically looking at you. Um, sometimes that happens. Maybe they're just not thinking. But she let them know, hey, I'm here. I have your attention for 15 minutes, so come listen to me. So maybe it's just speaking out. And they're not realizing that bad behavior, that non-bedside manner. I think all physicians should be nurses, by the way. I also think that so that they know what's happening bedside. Uh, because sometimes they just get caught in the next patient that they have to see. 
Um, and I hear that physicians are actually being kind of hounded to cut down on that face time that they have with the patient. So uh, good for Yvonne for saying, hey, I made it to my appointment, I'm dressed, I'm here, and you need to talk to me and pay attention. So just because they're behind that computer screen doesn't make them a bad physician. It means shedding light to the behavior and saying, you know, I'm here, let's talk. Um, when you don't have a good physician is if they're not being open and responsive. You've had that conversation and they still are jamming away on their computer and not paying attention to you. Then it might be time to start looking for a second uh, help. The prognosis with lupus, lupus ranges from mild to life-threatening. The more mild forms, of course, are the skin involvement. The more severe forms is when lupus starts to affect the heart, the kidney, the lungs, right? Those are our major organ systems. Uh, for whatever reason, lupus loves the kidneys. Um, thanks, for Diana, for pointing out about the NSAIDs, but for whatever reason, it loves to attack the kidneys. Um, that's something we're still battling with research to figure out how to help that. But truthfully so, lupus patients can look forward to a good life with lupus. We just need to find the roadmap and the steps to get there, find the right pathway, find remission. And death from lupus is uncommon. Typically what patients are passing away from are the complications of lupus. So kidney failure, heart failure, blood clots. Um, unfortunately, these are side effects that can happen with lupus patients, but it's never lupus per se. It's usually secondary to a condition that they have. So the LFA is leading the way with research programs. This is something we should all boast about and be prideful about, is that the LFA is ensuring that lupus research and donor dollars are going towards the right lupus research to help us further along. Um, I still remember when Benlista was passed that 10-year span of the medication being developed, going through the FDA process, and everyone just nail-biting because 52 years had gone by and not one medication had been developed for, a new medication developed for lupus patients, where other diseases were coming out with two, three medications. So with the passing of Benlista into the FDA and being prescribed, really opened a floodgate for other lupus research and medications to start. And so we should be having a boom pretty soon, I would say, with research here. Um, so we take a three-pronged approach, a comprehensive approach. Uh, we educate, we advocate, and we fund research. Um, there's also other community agencies that we should be looking at. Um, how many people are doing the Ask the Expert series? How many people know what that is? Yay! So for you that don't know what the Ask the Expert series is, is we have monthly call call meetings where we get leaders in the healthcare field to talk about certain topics. Uh, February was like lupus and intimacy. Uh, one month might be men and lupus. Uh, financial barriers with lupus. So we have hot topics where we're finding specialists within the healthcare system to talk about them. As a facilitator, as a patient navigator, as a boots on the ground, as a patient, join in on these calls and learn something new every time. Um, so the Ask the Expert series is a call-in group, and you can get that information on the website, in our office. Um, I've been out of commission for a little bit, so I don't know if the new calendar is out yet, but it should be coming out soon if it hasn't, not yet. Um, the other great tool that we have is the Expert Series. These are video series that we, again, find experts throughout uh, the U.S. and have them talk, and we uh, post them on YouTube. You should get them in your newsletters and things of that nature. Um, those are great resources, too. Uh, a great thing to do with your group is listen to one of those talks. You know, have it play. It's probably a good 10 minutes. And then and talk about what you just learned there and everyone share. Um, so those are great t resources and tools that we provide. Um, of course, the local chapter is a great resource because we have the support groups, the fundraising events, uh, advocacy events that we're hosting, um, health insurance if patients are needing help. You know, you can have them actually call the office uh, to talk to the patient navigator. Typically, it's me. Eventually, I will be back, I promise. Um, but going to Medicare.gov or healthcare.gov to help people find the right insurance for them. Uh, financial assistance. We do have um, a small angel grant. Um, this is for patients that are involved with our chapter, actively going to support groups, signing up for things. It's a very small stipend, um, so you have to file a petition and fill out an application. Um, and it goes through the board for a process. Uh, it's a very small stipend, and the, 
I think it's up to $200 to help pay for a medical expense. Um, and so those are, those are annual, uh, excuse me, those are some financial assistance programs that our chapter offers and our national organization may have um, further information on what they have. Uh, Social Security information there, disabilityinfo.gov. United Way is a great resource. I don't know if anyone's ever called 211. They're a great resource. Um, we've helped a lot of patients try to find uh, how to not get their electric shut off or how to keep their heat on. Um, so it's all community-based local in their, their city specifically. Um, and then clinicaltrials.gov or uh, lupusfoundation.org forward slash clinical trials for more clinical trial information. And then just our last slide of contact information. You know, we, we want to point out to the patients and people that are coming, you know, to connect with us on Facebook. Our Facebook page is pretty awesome right now. I've been scrolling through and seeing some really great hot news. So I don't know if you guys are all on social media, but it seems that the team's really getting it together. I don't know if that's all Amber and, and Jackie. Um, so it's really staying connected with the hot news that's out there. Of course, we email all the time. I want to know if people are giving us their spam or junk email because we can see who's opening it and, and the open rates on it. So you guys better be opening your email. So that's why we're leaning on social media to get to you because it just seems to come through the news feed. Uh, so definitely stay connected. We want to educate the groups to check your email because that's the easiest way for us to get a hold of you. Otherwise, we're going to be doing robocalls and, and trying to call everyone that gives us their phone numbers to get that information out. We only do that during walk season. Um, but staying connected with us, using our toll-free, the one no lupus to get directly to our office. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday, um, 8.30 to 5, and you'll get a real person. Um, and we always do follow up with phone call and directing people to our website, lupusgreaterohio.org, for the most latest accurate information out there. So this was really a vague, very quick overview. And I wanted to point out some of the few things that I wanted you to talk with uh, your group about. And I know Dr. Van Warren and Dr. Singer highlighted um, some of those things that we want to educate what lupus is and how to get involved with. Uh, the organization.